On 31st October 2000, the United Nations Security Council unanimously passed Resolution 1325, formally recognizing the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, the impact of conflict on women and the significant role women play in conflict prevention, resolution and post-conflict reconstruction. Since then, nine further resolutions have been adopted, addressing women's active and effective participation and the prevention of conflict-related sexual violence. The Women, Peace and Security Agenda, popularly abbreviated as WPS, is underlined by four pillars, participation, protection, prevention, relief and recovery. Today, 32 African countries have adopted national action plans to implement WPS. Welcome to Season 4 of the She Stands for Peace podcast, a series by the United Nations Office to the African Union, supported by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, regular listeners of the podcast will know that past seasons have been a series of interviews with key actors working to achieve WPS in Africa. In this fourth season, we depart from this format. Instead, Each episode unpacks various topics aligned with the four pillars of WPS, with insights from guests playing critical roles in achieving the agenda. In the last episode, we discussed the inclusion and participation of women in various stages of the peace process. In this episode, we look deeper into early warning systems, asking how women's participation in this area is and should be protected. Most listeners know that early warning systems are processes for forecasting potential dangers, from climate-related dangers to violent conflict. You will also know that there is clear evidence that natural disasters impact and can lead to conflict. When natural disasters happen in conflict-affected communities, the consequences are severe, leading to a myriad of issues that deepen the existing fragility in that environment. The consequences are even more dire when natural disasters, conflict and fragility intersect with other issues like economics, limited women's rights, food security and so on. When done right and on time, early warning can lead to conflict prevention and opportunities to respond at the early stages of conflict and in post-conflict environments, for example, to contain outbreaks. Since the first formal proposal for the use of early warning systems in the 80s, There have been several initiatives in Africa. For example, the African Union's Continental Early Warning System, the Central Africa Early Warning System of the Economic Community of Central Africa States, the Warning and Response Network of the Economic Community of West African States, and in 2002, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, also known as IGAD, established the Conflict Early Warning and Response Mechanism in East Africa. They were not in existence for quite a long time since uh, the year 2002. And uh, C1O is established as a a multi uh, stakeholder and uh, a multi level entity, uh, conflict early warning and response. And that structure is very significant uh, for the the topic we are discussing now, which is about women, peace, and security agenda. That's Kamlos Omogo, director of EGAD's Conflict Early Warning and Response Mechanism, C1. He spoke to us about the opportunities to address gender-sensitive early warning systems. There are several lessons we can learn, uh, six of which I would want to share with you. The first is that the way uh, C1 is organized allows for inclusivity in uh, participation of different stakeholders, women included. Because at every level or every structure of our work, we have a multi agency where we have uh, different government entities participating, community-based organizations, youth organizations, women organizations. So if women are not participating in any of those structures, then we'll easily know it because we have the checklist on who should be part and parcel of that structure. Uh, the second uh, lesson is also connected with the first one. And it's inbuilt in the C1 structure where the participation of uh, women is facilitated all the way from the grassroots. Because at the local level, we have 
local peace committees that uh, have the participation also from women actors. And uh, at the national level, again, we have women uh, organizations as part and parcel of the National Conflict Early Warning Unit. And so they engage with the decisions that are being made at that particular level. And at the regional level, we have the Technical Committee on Early Warning and Early Response that then feeds into the Committee of Permanent Secretary. So again, there you find women are fully represented. The third lesson was just about uh, targeted support to uh, initiatives that are either led by the women organizations or aimed at uh, increasing participation of women in uh, conflict prevention initiatives. And we do this through a uh, rapid uh, response fund uh, where we are making resources available to different implementing agencies, including uh, women uh, organized groups. The other area is about tracking the participation itself as well as the quality of participation because many times we say women participated, but it's very low in terms of how we track whether they are participating and even if they are participating, uh, what is the quality of their participation? So within our monitoring and evaluation indicators, we have included an indicator that tracks the number of women who participated in a substantive way. So we are able to know, even if there were just 10 women, what role did they actually play? Did they, for example, facilitate a session? Did they present a paper or this kind of thing? Otherwise, the more of the numbers, but we lose the quality of their participation. So that is uh, some, something that I think we found very worthwhile. Also, in terms of entrenching sensitivity to gender issues is uh, the sensitization activities that we engage in, especially for the national early warning leadership, because that is where we believe it starts. So if they are not able to know that they should be gender sensitive uh, from the project design all the way to reporting, then already we are losing something. So we do uh, trainings of sensitization exercises for the Sewero leadership on gender inclu inclusion in various aspects of our work. The final lesson I believe we can learn from here is uh, in terms of our early warning indicators themselves, which is actually the key thing here, and uh, we've disaggregated our early warning indicators to be able to capture the different gendered groups. For example, we are looking at questions like uh, who did what to whom. Now, that enables us to be able to respond to whether women are uh, just the victims or are they also participating in perpetuating conflict? So that is a very important disaggregation measure that we are using to be able to know to what extent are women either engaged in peace building or at what extent are they also victims or at what extent are they perpetrators? And I think this is a very important information because we want to get the totality of both gender participation in uh, peace and uh, security issues. And this is just to say that in summary that we've been able to really mainstream our uh, women participation. Uh, we need to strengthen our collaboration in tracking participation of women participation in peace and conflict prevention activities, as well as sharing this information. And by this, I mean uh, putting in place indicators that would uh, track uh, how women are participating in peace processes. But I think there are also other uh, such kind of initiatives out there. So it's about being deliberate. Sometimes when you just, uh, for example, make a call for proposals and you are not very deliberate when you are, for example, analyzing who has uh, made the request, you end up having a disproportionate number of men or men like institutions benefiting more than the other. So in our case, we have, we have tried to have that uh, key consideration. Even when we are saying we are, we are putting out a call for proposal, uh, that we will be intentional about uh, ensuring that women-led initiatives are, are are beneficial. And the third area of collaboration is the biggest in terms of coordinated advocacy, coordinated lobbying uh, for inclusivity. And I say this because uh, working in a regional organization, where sometimes when we are calling for uh, regional meetings we say uh, the, the leaders of a particular agency. So in our case, for example, we'll be uh, convening a meeting and saying we are calling the heads of national early warning units. Now, it will surprise you that out of the seven uh, national early warning units, only one is headed by a woman, which is Uganda. So if you only convene a meeting and you say only heads of these institutions, then you will be having a meeting uh, just of men and maybe one woman. 
So we need to continue doing more advocacy so that uh, even at the national level, the leadership of some of these institutions are women, so that at least you can get balanced uh, participation. Uh, but as we are working on that, the other way is to be intentional in your invitation to such kind of uh, meeting, uh, so that you, and this of course where collaboration is needed, because instead of saying we call seven heads of national alliance or one in unit, we can say two, the head and a technical person. And that technical person we specifically reserve for the other gender. So we try to be very intentional in such a way that we ensure that uh, the participation of uh, different genders are included. Otherwise, if we don't collaborate and uh, be deliberate in terms of our joint advocacy, joint lobbying, then uh, we will continue uh, isolating especially the women, from decision-making, especially at the regional level. And this is something that I believe has to be taken seriously. And uh, with the active uh, leadership of our gender manager, uh, this is work that is uh, already been happening, uh, the auditing of EGAD processes and initiatives to ensure that uh, issues of gender inclusivity are well anchored in the, in the programs. Applying a gender lens to early warning systems has proved critical to forecasting signs of potential conflict-related gender-based violence and ensuring that responses are not harmful to women, however unintended. And yet, gender remains an underused analytical tool. When it comes to conflict-related disasters, early warning systems are critical to mitigating mortality. According to an analysis by the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR, countries with strong early warning system coverage experience just one-eighth of disaster mortality compared to those with limited or no coverage. In Africa, only 40% of the continent has such systems, and these still have significant challenges with quality. In 2022, the African Centre for Meteorological Applications for Development, ACMED, in Niger, inaugurated a new continental multi-hazard advisory centre in line with the Early Warnings for All initiative, which is the executive action plan launched by the UN Secretary General at COP27 in Egypt. And we'll share a link to the document in the show notes and on the She Stands for Peace podcast page. The way I like to start will be with an African proverb, which goes that a woman holds the knife at the sharp end. Now, what this means in the context of women, peace, and security is that across the entire African continent, they feel the brunt not just of the changing climate on clean cooking. Over 700,000 Africans die and over 60% of them are women. In context, this provides a reminder of the resilience of the African woman, especially our mothers, our sisters that are dotted across the continent. They actually are facing the brunt, enduring high levels of unemployment to bearing indoor pollution that kills over 700,000 Africans with over 60% of them being women. That's Dr. Richard Munang, Head of Global Environment Monitoring Systems and Early Warning for the Environment Unit at the United Nations Environmental Programme, UNEP. We asked him about the role climate disasters play in conflict and opportunities to address the gaps in quality of early warning systems in Africa. Up to 70% of the food that is produced in the continent is led by women. And so within this context, the reality then becomes that providing solutions, not only to reduce indoor pollution, but also to empower women, especially under the changing climate that is not only reducing agricultural productivity, but is plunging millions into suffering as a result of droughts and floods, it will become very, very imperative that to drive the socioeconomic resilience of women will actually be the best pathway to peace. And with this, three things need to be done. Early warnings, not only to be able to address the rapid onset, for example, like flooding or drought, but also turning early warnings into early actions, like providing alternatives like climate action solutions, like simple solar dryers that mothers can be able to dry their food, their vegetables. What needs to be done at the core is that it's not just about having women discussed within the context of security and peace, but giving them the tools that can be able to drive these opportunities. And therefore, looking at that to give women not just the voice at the table, but also to ensure that they can actually participate meaningfully as they also drive their socioeconomic opportunities is the best way to go. Giving women not only the voice, but ensuring that there is institutional 
reforms that prioritize women leadership in rules, we have to understand that with that, women are the center of driving the sustainable development goals. The world in six years from today will not be able to achieve that. And so this empowerment of women needs to move from what I call a core center. What it means is that resources are located to support gender issues cannot just be as a word of mouth, but it should actually be to help empower women to put food on the table and more money in more pockets. Because socioeconomic resilience is actually the most powerful force for gender inclusivity. And that is how peace can come. Because without having money when there is a drought, without having an alternative to be able to move to other places, to be able to afford alternatives, then definitely peace will never reign. The entire African continent, as it is today, have investments in early warning that are actually wanting. And early warning systems, as we know, stand at for the effectiveness in forestalling and reducing risk impact, be it climate change, be it biodiversity loss, be it pollution. As a result of this, it therefore means that without having early warning systems that can be able to provide information to be acted on, the continent transformational development under the changing climate will be at risk. For example, giving just 24 hours notice of an impending climate change hazardous event can reduce damages by up to 30%. And that an investing 800 million US dollars in such systems in developing countries with most of the countries in the African continent would prevent losses of up to 16 billion annually. And therefore it means that Early warning systems are quite very, very instrumental. But the most important aspect within the early warning system is that it is not just providing the information. Because if you provide the information to a community that do not have the resources to be able to relocate, that do not have the resources to be able to have alternatives when their farms will be inundated with flooding or when there is a drought, then it will just be as good as nothing. It therefore means that translating early warnings into early actions is where the niche of every action is like this is what we call early warning for the environment which is simply how do we monitor the risk and at the same time provide solutions immediately to avert that risk and also help ensure that as we are forestalling risk as we are reducing the risk either it is from biodiversity loss or from climate change or from pollution then we are also at the same time empowering people to be able to assess the solutions. And so to move from just early warning to early action and help ensure that if there is a prediction that there is going to be a cyclone, how do we then ensure that the community where the cyclone is going to be impacted can actually have the resources that they need to then be able to avert the cyclone and move away, not only to prevent life loss, but also where they move to, they can have the opportunities and the resources to be able to settle, to be able to afford alternatives, food, shelter, water, etc. And that is the direction in which the early warning approach needs to take, and we call that now the early warning for the environment, which focuses on the risk, the solutions, and how each and everyone can then be able to invest in it. Engagement with local communities has proven effective for early warning response. For example, the United Nations Organization Stabilization Mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, also known as MONUSCO, enhanced its early warning and responsive mechanisms by developing community alert networks working with local communities. The UN Secretary General estimates that this community approach to early warning has physically protected over 300,000 displaced persons. And if you want to know more about the work of MONUSCO, head over to episode five of this podcast to listen to our interview with Binto Keita, special representative and head of MONUSCO. You have to challenge the mindset and the thinking about you get into a home, which is great. You have to do that. But the internalization of what needs to happen on the ground at community level, you cannot just be here in the, on, on the top of the mountain and you are thinking and you are looking down and you are thinking, okay, this is going to trickle down to the communities because the fabric of the society is not up. It's in the homes, in the, in the camps, in the uh, uh, villages. So it, we have to find a way to connect the two. And for this, I kind of 
uh, sense that more and more there is more movement out there, uh, civil society organizations and uh, NGOs who are challenging the system. And we hear a number of voices of young people and also um, young men and women who are saying, if we keep doing the same thing which has been done over centuries, because it has been taught in schools and we have textbooks and uh, we, we keep doing the same thing and we keep having results where we are seeing the world going uh, in a direction which is not necessarily where we want to be. So why don't we pause and say, what would it take for all of us to reflect on the way we approach peace in any part of the world and we rethink how the global uh, governance framework is fitted or no longer fitted, I tend to go to no longer fitted with the dynamics which have come now in the 21st century DNA with this digitalization of the world and the interconnectivity. Even when there is no electricity, I can tell you with on their phones, the people get to react to things that are not necessarily in their own place, but to global level. So the global, for me, is important as a concept. Now, how do we do it, not just business-oriented global, so what is uh, considered global level, we have it local, but from what I shared with you, which is, for me, the ownership, the internalization of a vision and the society that the people want to go about, we have to be respectful of all of this. And I sometimes I feel that we are very arrogant in the way we approach the people at the community level. So the ones that are succeeding at community level are the ones who are humble enough not to create even more barriers but to live with the community, to understand the communities, and to, uh, again, I always talk about accompanying, which is more difficult than just ordering, giving instructions, and, and saying, okay, here's the template, go. It's easy to do, but the day you are not there, it goes back to where it was, and so it's not helping. The African Peace and Security Architecture is the umbrella for critical AU mechanisms for promoting peace, security, and stability on the continent. And within APSA is the Peace and Security Council, tasked with anticipating and preventing conflict. So we thought it would be great to end this episode by hearing from Commissioner Bankole Adoye, who is the Commissioner at the AU's Political Affairs Peace and Security Department, on what he sees as the urgent priorities and opportunities to improve women's participation in Africa's early warning systems and the rethink we need as we approach 25 years of UNSCR 1325. Specific to your question, let me first of all draw a context. In a recent high-level event, as part of the 20th anniversary of the African Union Peace and Security Council, held in Swakopmund, Namibia, where we initiated a new process. This new process will energize the women base, civil society, he for she institutions like the African Union as well, and others to continue to promote women participation in political processes, in peacemaking, in peace building, and ensuring that the protection of lives will be guaranteed. So based on this, we continue to prioritize conflict prevention and early warning. Women participation is critical in this, and as you may be aware, we are one of the continents with the highest number of national action plans. 34 to date of our 55 member states have adopted national action plans. And we are now trying to, to get the implementation of these plans to data collection, gender mainstreaming, working on early warning, particularly through the regional economic communities and regional mechanisms. So we must learn best practices in early warning how does the African continent respond to the implementation in its whole entirety? And I think this will give us the necessary pep to promote silence in the guns, ensuring that women remain key defenders of human rights, protection, peace building, 
and the necessary steps to ensure that in mediation, through FEMWISE mechanism, through the wise youth, young men and women are able to contribute to early warning, conflict prevention, and deliver the necessary goal of a peaceful and secure, effective governed continent. That's it for this episode of She Stands for Peace. Next time, we turn our attention to women's participation in peace negotiations. Until then, stand for peace with Africa's Women Peace and Security Agenda.